beings, friends, fellow Earthlings, and maybe explorers of the deep. And welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and celebrates the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life and the universe. I'm your host, Dr. Graham, the cosmobiologist, Lau, and we're brought to you by the NASA Astrobiology Program and Seganet.org. Today's episode is going to take us on a deep oceanic dive with a researcher who has had more time at sea and in submersibles than anyone I've ever personally met. Uh, that's right, we're going to be diving down into the majestic deep of the ocean to talk about some current research in the realm of hydrothermal vents and mud volcanoes and other interactions of ocean water with the sea floor uh, and how that relates to astrobiology as well. Uh, but first, as always, we like to give a shout out to all of you out there who've been watching our show and supporting us over the years now. Uh, this is our 45th episode. It's so exciting. Um, a special thanks goes to Denise uh, at AstroBioDNZ on Twitter. Uh, Denise has been fantastic and has been the ambassador of our show for the past several episodes. Uh, and has been great at sharing information about our guests and things that we're doing. But we do appreciate all that you do, all of you, in sharing the show and staying curious and asking questions. Now, our guest for this show today is Dr. Jeff Wheat. Uh, Dr. Wheat is an expert in the realm of oceanography and the geochemistry of the ocean floor. He earned an undergraduate degree in mathematics from the University of New Hampshire before going on to earn his master's degree and doctoral degree in oceanography from the University of Washington. He's since had numerous appointments in various research institutions and is currently a research professor at the University of Fairbanks, uh, University of Alaska in Fairbanks, and is a research affiliate through the Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. Uh, Dr. Wheat's research focuses on processes that influence the cycles of elements in the oceans, uh, specifically looking at how fluids transport materials through the oceanic crust uh, and back into the seawater uh, in places like hydrothermal vents and mud volcanoes, seeps, and more. Dr. Wheat has participated in 79 ocean expeditions, of which 49 of those have included a submersible or an ROV component, uh, and he intends to do more. And so please help me in welcoming and saying thank you for joining us to Dr. Jeff Wheat. Uh, Dr. Wheat, thank you for joining us for Ask an Astrobiologist. Well, thank you for, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, like I said, you've been on, on far more expeditions in the ocean than anyone I've ever personally met, which I think is really cool. And I'd love to talk a lot about your current uh, research, upcoming research, and exploring the ocean floor. But first, I'd love to hear for our audience what your career path has been, um, specifically what kind of drove you into this realm of wanting to get into the chemical oceanography and, and geology of the seafloor. Well, like uh, I think like most people, it was a circuitous path. It all started out um, you know, visiting and hanging out with my grandfather when I was a kid and spending time on the ocean and in the ocean and swimming, everything from fishing, swimming to boating and so on. Um, and then I went to uh, the University of New Hampshire because they had a undergraduate minor in oceanography and I knew I wanted to do something in oceanography. I just didn't know what. It started off in geology. Um, and after my first year, I decided when it came time to take um, petrology and mineralogy that that didn't look like a, of my, you know, that wasn't for me. So instead, I switched over to math and uh, continued to work for a, a, an oceanographer on campus, a chemical oceanographer who was dealing with uh, nutrients in some of the local estuaries and, and uh, rivers. So uh, I wonder if you can tell us what, what, what is the importance of studying those kinds of things, um, of studying estuaries, rivers, nutrients, cycling in the ocean? Um, well, uh, exactly that. Um, the uh, rivers are a great source of solutes to the ocean. It's one of the major aspects of uh, tracing elements in the ocean and the cycle of elements. So, uh, And a lot happens in estuaries. You might have a lot of metals coming in, uh, getting deposited in that estuaries. Um, some estuaries produce metals, and it's all just part of the cycle of understanding what goes into the ocean and um, what goes out of the ocean. That's very cool. Um, and so that kind of like led you then into your current research, which you've been doing for some time now, is studying you know this cycling of nutrients, cycling of elements through the oceans, 
Um, and then, you know, you've been down now in, in a bunch of submersibles. Um, I wonder for our audience, if you can explain what that process is of, of going down in a submersible to explore a process in the ocean itself as a human, um, and maybe even what it was like your first time going down in something like Alvin. Yeah, um, I've been down in several different subs, but they're pretty much all the same in the sense of uh, there's a defined time where you expect it to be on deck, and when they expect the, the sub to come up, it's usually 8 in the morning till 5 at night. Um, and you get in the sub, uh, they launch you, which is usually pretty quick because they want to get you away from the ship as quickly as possible. And then it takes a couple hours to go down, and on the way down, there's a lot of bioluminescence. As the uh, sub sinks through um, the water, it disturbs the, the local critters, and they just bioluminesce, and it's quite a show sometimes. And then once you're down at the bottom, you probably have four or five hours on the bottom to do your work. And it's uh, quite cold because there's no heaters, and it's uh, the uh, titanium sphere cools quickly. Um, and then it's back up, another two hours back to the surface, where you bob around on the ocean until they get the ship near you and can pick you up and put you on the, on the uh, fan tail of the ship. But it's uh, it's quite something. The first time you're down there, you're you're just looking in awe of that you're actually at the seafloor and all the cool critters that you've never seen before. Um, and it's uh, it's certainly a, an eye-opening experience. That sounds like almost similar to space exploration as well. You know, you're going into this very remote, exotic environment where humans don't belong, and, and it requires something like a spacesuit or a submersible or a spaceship to protect us from that environment. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned, you know, it's four or five hours in the bottom. Um, one thing I wondered, and maybe our audience does too, you know, like we always ask astronauts, like, how do you go to the bathroom in space? But I think four or five hours is probably long and probably short enough. It doesn't actually matter that much when you're down in the submersible. Um, I do recall from the film uh, Sphere, um, which is based on a book by Michael Crichton, there's a scene where they're descending in a submersible through the water and the, the psychologist on board hears the creaking of the hull of the submersible and becomes terrified. Um, does that happen in real life? Uh, what's it like? Is there any experience that kind of scares you a little bit? Um, there's no creaking uh, in most part because the pilot has music playing. Uh, depending on their taste, it could be uh, you know anything from classical to uh, hard rock. And so you usually don't hear anything like that. Um, there is always some condensation after you're down on the seafloor for a while, um, as the, uh, sphere cools and as you keep breathing. And, uh, so that always adds a nice little mixture of fun with the, with the new people, um, you know, suggesting that potentially the sub's leaking. <laughs> <laughs> That's gotta be a little terrifying. <laughs> so, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, but mostly they're so in awe of what's going on outside um, and that they're down there that, um, yeah, it's it's a lot, a lot of things are lost on the new people, which, which makes me wonder, is that the same way with an astronaut? You know, the, the first time are they, they're up, are, is their first day kind of useless because they're in awe of all the technology and the beauty and everything else uh, before they can get settled in? Um, okay. It's a very good question. Yeah, it would be worth asking an astronaut what that's like. Um, I know so that now, now we do longer stays in the International Space Station, but it used to be that a lot of the food that was sent to space with astronauts, especially for shorter trips, was, was spicier, uh, more flavorful than usual because when they go to space for the first time, their, all of their, their mucus and their sinuses kind of rises up everywhere because there's no gravity pulling it down. And so it actually interferes with their sense of smell a little bit. And so tasting things and smelling things is a little different in space for the astronauts, which must also be kind of a, a unique experience to kind of have that for the first time. Plus just the awe of looking at the earth from space, or in your case, the awe of seeing something like bioluminescence that far down in the ocean as you're disturbing things like dinoflagellates and other creatures going down. Yes. Yeah. And, and there, and being on the seafloor, there's, there's new critters everywhere. Um, you, you know, if you wanted to find a new species, it wouldn't be very difficult. Yeah, I imagine that's a great way to get a, a bunch of papers published is just to go down the seafloor and just discover a whole bunch of new species and things like that. Um, and in that vein of exploring the seafloor, through the NASA Astrobio Twitter account, we asked our audience um, when the first year is that humans went down in a submersible and discovered hydrothermal vents. Uh, we had a few options of 1960, 1965, 
1977, uh, most people said 1971, but it was actually 1977. Um, so there were many years before that, there were people who were hypothesizing. There were these systems on the seafloor where it appeared there was some heat coming out. Um, there were some you know, potential ideas of this idea that there could be something down there. But it was 77 when the first paper came out and the first people went down and observed hydrothermal vents. That's the same year that Voyager 1 launched to space uh, for our audience. Uh, so, Dr. Wheat, I'm wondering if you could kind of give us your vision of what, what hydrothermal vents are on the seafloor um, and maybe even help us connect those to other worlds. So, so they vary uh, drastically depending on the geologic setting as well as how hot the fluids are that are coming out. So like the ones that you were talking about at the Galapagos, uh, those by the time there were high temperature waters at depth, but they mixed and cooled before conductively before they came out at the seafloor. And so they were lower temperature coming out, but they were carried reduced uh, elements and supported life, uh, tube worms and uh, microbial mats and so on. And, and, and then other animals would come by and eat those guys. Um, then there's the uh, more of the high temperature ones where the high temperature fluids are exiting at the seafloor. Those are typically metal rich and form the nice big sulfide ore deposits um, that are on the seafloor. And those are quite spectacular. Those can be 10, 20 meters high, you know, meters in diameter and just absolutely beautiful um, and intricate with water coming out in different areas. Um, and, uh, everything from worms to crabs to a whole ecosystem on the seafloor. And then there's also other places where water comes out much slower, let's say uh, through mud volcanism. And those can be everything from uh, subduction zones that could be mostly from the, the deep earth um, and could be uh, mostly methane related fluids, or they could be from serpentine formation and uh, hydrogen and methane rich. So that's, Quite, quite a variety. Yeah, and there's, there's, there seems there's so many different places on the seafloor to study some of these really intriguing processes, and there are lots of different processes. Um, and for me, as an astrobiologist, to connect that then to like Enceladus, you know, with, with, with NASA's Cassini, we observed um, with Enceladus plumes of fluid coming out, and we, we measured some of those plumes and had detections that could suggest the, the, the likelihood of hydrothermal vents. Uh, in that ocean, um, I wonder, like as someone who studied hydrothermal vents and studied mud volcanoes and these processes, do you think it's likely that, that many of the ocean worlds in our solar system and maybe even in the galaxy um, are, are, you know, have plentiful hydrothermal vent systems and plenty of these potential ecosystems as well? Uh, it's entirely likely as long as there's some sort of techno tectonic forces uh, in play. Um, some of the other things uh, that are of interest that I spend a lot of my effort on is some of the ridge plank work where there's uh, no, where, where basically the fluid flow is driven by differences in conduction um, and differences in basement topography and sedimentation. So they're um, typically lower temperature, uh, 15 to 60 degrees Celsius and uh, less altered, not so much the metal carrying fluids like a high temperature hydrothermal system. Um, but you don't really need that mantle source right there, like a high temperature hydrothermal system needs a mantle source of heat. Um, or uh, in subduction zones, you need tectonic plates moving uh, in one direction or another. So, so uh, yeah, there's a, a whole variety of uh, means for fluid to flow through an ocean crust and to then uh, advance some of these water rock reactions within the crust. Um, so it just depends on, on the particular planet or, uh, you know, body that you're looking at. It's very intriguing. And you also mentioned, you know, with mud volcanoes and some of these serpentinizing systems, um, for our audience, serpentinization is this process where certain minerals will interact with water and form things like hydrogen gas. Uh, and there are creatures here on Earth who can use that hydrogen gas and something like carbon dioxide and make methane. Uh, as an energy source, as a metabolism. And so it's really intriguing as a place for us to kind of, of hunt um, for potential signs of biological activity. There might even be serpentinizing systems from the past on Mars um, for us to explore. So I'm very glad you made that connection. And, and we talked before the show a little bit about some of your upcoming research on mud volcanoes. 
Um, and you mentioned something to me called Blue Mud. Um, I'm wondering if you could go a little bit into explaining what that is and, and why that's an intriguing thing for us to study on the seafloor. Yeah, um, serpentization and mud volcanoes from it have uh, existed on Earth for uh, up to maybe billions of years. And, and where it's happening right now is at the Mariana Forearc, where the Mariana Trench is dipping down underneath the Philippine Trench. And as that, um, as the Pacific Plate dips underneath the Philippine Plate, the Philippine Plate has some cracks in it. Uh, the water from the Pacific Plate goes up through those cracks, reacts with the mantle, um, in the overlying plate, and that uh, reaction causes the water and the heat with uh, the mantle rock forms serpentinite minerals, and it forms a mud matrix with uh, serpentinite minerals as well as water. The pH of these fluids can be uh, anywhere from 10 to uh, 12 and a half, and uh, they form some, some of the largest mud volcanoes on Earth, up to 50 kilometers wide and four kilometers high. And the mud itself is blue. It's the only place I've ever gone um, where you find naturally occurring blue mud. And we don't know exactly why it's blue, um, but it, when you have it out on the counter and it's uh, exposed to atmospheric oxygen, um, over a period of a couple of days, it turns green, sort of what you would expect from a serpentine light. So it has something to do with the, the way it's uh, reduced fluids or gases that are dissolved or part of the matrix that make it form blue, uh, a blue color, but it's, it's quite fascinating. And, and as you pointed out too, there's microbes that live in that system. Um, and so uh, as a conveyor belt from the Pacific plate, the big question is, do you get some of these microbes that take the conveyor belt down and then come back up uh, through some of these mud volcanoes? Some of them only get up to 150 degrees Celsius, uh, some even less. Um, Probably the ones that come up, you know, they reach warmer temperatures like 250 degrees Celsius at, at depth. Probably there's no microbes there, but but there's potential for the, that whole cycle and loop. And um, since these mud volcanoes are, some of them are probably 50 million years old, you have an ample time for abiotic reactions at these high pHs, high methane, um, high hydrogen uh, fluids to uh, potentially form um, simple inorganics and, and other molecules that may be uh, quite helpful for life. Yeah, and when I mean, we really are just getting to touch the tip of the iceberg, really, and what lives in the ocean and, 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 and what things dwell in the ocean sediments as well. And I love that idea of some organisms potentially going down the conveyor belt and back up again. Um, you know, the ocean floor it has so much for us to still explore and, and to learn. Uh, we even, on Twitter, through NASA Astrobio, we asked our audience um, roughly how much of the seafloor has been explored um, based on current estimates. Uh, we had some different answers come in at 10%, 15 20 and 25%. Uh, most people said 10%. Some said even less. Um, but actually, right now, the, the number is somewhere around 20% or so of high-resolution mapping has occurred on the seafloor. But then for exploration, for going down and, and seeing what organisms is there, it, it seems that there's so there's still so much left for us to explore on the seafloor. I remember when I was an undergraduate student, we had this, this course. It was a marine ecology of the Chesapeake Bay. And it was the first time I learned about whale fall, uh, that when the bodies of cetaceans, when they die, their, their bodies fall to the ocean floor and they create these environments where microbes and, and other things can come in and dwell, not just for you know a few years as they break down the whale, but for centuries as, as the whale's body is degraded and eaten and kind of adds this chemical environment. Uh, so Dr. Reed, I'm wondering if you can give us kind of your vision of, you know, what is the seafloor to us humans? Why should we go explore this yet unexplored environment in some cases? What is it we learn from these creatures and processes on the deep sea? Yeah, well, um, I would say even though maybe 20% of the seafloor has been mapped, uh, you still have problems with, uh, let's say, nuclear subs, U.S. Navy subs running into seamounts, um, which was just recently another one did that. And uh, so I, I would say maybe, I mean, obviously we need to do a better job in, of more mapping and more coverage. But as for the actual being down there and seeing things, I would say it's way less than 1%. Um, and a, a sort of a case in point, uh, we were doing some work off Costa Rica at Dorado Outcrop. Um, 
And it was a purely geochemical, geophysical, uh, and some microbiology format um, in, in getting us there. And we discovered all these female octopuses that were um, sitting in the warm hydrothermal fluids with their egg cases. Um, and they were just in those hydrothermal areas uh, where the water is coming out. You know, just, you know, five meters away, there were no, you know, where there's no water coming out, there's no octopuses. And there were hundreds of them. And then um, a couple of years ago on Davidson Seamount off California, they found thousands of octopuses similar to these all laying their eggs, all in hydrothermal, all in low temperature hydrothermal fluids. And, uh, you know, it's just a, a whole set of ecology that we never learned about. And the only reason why we did was because we were down there for another purpose. Um, so I, I would say there's very little is known um, um, about the ecology. And then there's the question about ecosystem services. You know, what, what are these um, areas, these hydrothermal areas doing like say for the octopuses, how important is that on a global scale or for a species scale? And then what what are they doing by distributing carbon by going to these particular sites and living there and moving back and forth and so on? So I think there's a lot that we we just don't know. And um, you know, going there is a step step you know the first step. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, and it makes me want to go explore. I've been diving in the ocean before. Um, but certainly have nowhere near the experience you have of, of seeing the ocean firsthand and experiencing the ocean firsthand. Um, I currently live in Colorado, and we have no oceans nearby that I can just drive to. And, and I, I do miss the feeling um, of being close to the ocean, being close to the sea. I think it's been a, a call for humanity for a long time, and it's been a call for us to want to explore. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, what, what kind of advice do you have for potential young explorers right now who want to get involved in your line of work and get involved in these research studies on the seafloor? Um, I, I think there's many different avenues. There's certainly a lot of programs now that have um, started in the last decade to uh, get undergraduates involved in research as, and also to get them out to sea. Um, so there's a variety of different programs. I'd say um, contact maybe some of the larger oceanographic schools, uh, universities. Uh, they usually have um, people going to see and people need people to join them. If you're more involved in the technology, there's the MATE program uh, that's run out of Monterey Peninsula College, but it's a broader system now. And that was uh, designed to get people, maybe some of the engineering that have an engineering background or an operations background to get some experience and get to see. Um, so I, I think there's, there's different programs to get people out there. Yeah, I was I was very fortunate as an undergraduate student. I was accepted into an REU program. It's a research experiences for undergraduates program at the Graduate School of Oceanography in, in Rhode Island uh, in Narragansett Bay. Uh, I worked with Dr. Tatiana Reinerson uh, on a project extracting DNA from diatoms from different places around the two coasts of the continental United States. Um, and many younger people kind of uh, have used similar programs to get involved in research as well. So yes, I, I highly recommend those. Um, so for our audience who are watching, please remember you can ask questions right now in the chat, uh, on Facebook or in YouTube, if you're watching there, um, and, and, you know, bring your questions to Dr. Wheat about all of his research, all of his experience on the ocean floor and submersibles and in some of these systems we've discussed. Um, I always have to kind of relate things myself to, you know, our knowledge of the earth, our knowledge of space, what we're doing and exploring all these different areas. But I also like talking about things like science fiction and, and culture. Um, for me, I, I was very inspired to want to learn how to dive as a kid and learn more about the ocean from things like the film The Abyss. Um, I wonder, Dr. Reed, is, is there any anything in like writing or film that really inspired you or that you find uh, does a good job of explaining why we go out to the ocean and explore? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I have a real answer for that. Um, you know, I'm, I guess I'm one uh, person that likes doing things um, and, and just, uh, you know, being there and doing that um, and diving and finding different things. Um, I started off scuba diving uh, and, and like like yourself and going the shallow route and 
uh, finding things, working on things on the seafloor, mostly uh, getting lobster traps untangled and other things like that. But uh, um, I, I don't know if I actually have uh, a nice, you know, sort of movie bent to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I'm just kind of that, that kind of nerd. Um, but I do wonder. So uh, we do have some video footage we're sharing um, on, the, on the live stream as we discuss these things. Um, we're wondering if you can share some of that process of, of sampling from the seafloor, um, what that's like with both, you know, human in a submersible uh, versus a robot. Uh, what kinds of materials are you often collecting uh, for your research from the seafloor? Um, and, and also, I, I discovered in talking to you in prep for the show that there's uh, the capability of taking samples from the surface to, uh, from the subsurface to the surface without taking the sub back. And I, I'd love to hear more about that for our audience as well. Yeah. So, so uh, um, I guess one of the things I do a lot of is collect samples. Uh, I mostly collect fluids and um, uh, we have different, different types of samplers depending on the, on the fluids. If it's a high temperature fluid, you want a titanium sampler, uh, because it doesn't dissolve or react even at 300 degrees Celsius. Um, on the other hand, some of the low temperature fluids that we collect are maybe 10 or 15 degrees Celsius, and we have special samplers that we make out of uh, plastics or glass, glass so that we can avoid any organic uh, contamination. And um, some of the low temperature ones um, are, are you know we need smaller and smaller volumes because the analytical aspects are getting better. So, um, also uh, we're we've developed ways. Um, one of the things I've been involved in is uh, scientific ocean drilling, and in scientific ocean drilling, we're able to drill through the sediment into the basalt, uh, case the hole, and then lower instruments in the hole that can then uh, sample fluids over a period of time or discreetly by pumping on one of the valves and um, one of the umbilicals to extract water from a particular horizon in the hole. So um, as a result, we, we've had to develop different ways of being able to get, uh, get that water out and with the holes and as well as sealing the holes so that it's uh, nice and tight so that we're not getting extraneous flow from other areas. And um, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's I, I've spent many years um, at with a, an office at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and the, one of the good things of that interaction has been working with the engineers to help develop some of these techniques and to advance uh, some of these techniques. Oh, that's very cool. Um, I'm wondering if you if you had a grant. Um, and let's just say like, you know, a billion dollars or something, just something crazy. Um, if you had like unlimited funding, um, what would you want to study like right now in the ocean? What's like the, the most impressing thing for you right now in your research that you'd love to study if you could? So um, one of the things that I work with a lot of microbiologists and one aspect is what's living in the oceans in the subsea floor. How is it living there? How is it getting transported? what sort of rea uh, reactions are taking place to uh, dissolve minerals in one area and transport the solutes in another area and so on. And there's a lot of boreholes that have been drilled in the last 50 years as part of scientific ocean drilling. And a bunch of them were cased and are open um, at depth. And so I would develop a, a sensor sampling system that we could lower into those boreholes and to be able to uh, set up around some of the hydraulic um, areas where there's a very permeable areas where water flows and be able to sit there and collect that fluid. Seems like uh, most of the water that flows through the ocean crust occurs in about less than 1% of the rock. So it's very focused um, and to be able to sample some of that fluid for both the yeah. chemical and microbial aspects. That sounds pretty incredible. Um, maybe we'll write that grant and get a billion dollars. And, and <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we did talk before the show, uh, and I learned that that you've also developed this this camp uh, for young people to become to to get motivated about marine science, to learn about oceanography. Um, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about this camp you've developed uh, and and what you've experienced in seeing young people 
getting interested in, in oceanography? Well, um, I, I, I do this. Uh, I started this camp because I wanted to get back. Um, I've been very, I, I've been blessed with having the opportunity to uh, have a, the career that I've had, had the experience that I, I've had. And so I thought one way of giving back would be to set up a camp. Um, and most camps are, you know, you kick a ball around or maybe you're coding. Um, and what I wanted to do is have a, a camp that had more technology and science uh, merged and where everything's hands-on. And so we developed a camp for hands-on activities, uh, four hands-on activities that all center around the theme of the seafloor and the science that um, is conducted on the seafloor and the operations that are required uh, to actually do the do that science. So we've got um, uh, summer camps, week-long day summer camps for third to fifth graders, sixth to ninth graders. And then uh, last year we developed one for eighth to 10th graders, um, all with different levels of complexity, all with four hands-on activities uh, per day and um, all with the goal of expanding the understanding of what happens at the seafloor and subsea floor and uh, how you get the, to do the science. That's so cool. Yeah, in, in 2019, I was fortunate. I was a, a, a leader uh, for the National Geographic Student Expeditions. Uh, we took some high school level students into the Boston Harbor um, with the Massachusetts Sea Grant. Uh, and we, we had them spend some time developing uh, underwater submersibles using Legos. And then they went in and explored. And uh, some of them were trying to catch fish or to use some, some bait to lure crabs over to them. Others were, were trying to answer some scientific questions about the phytoplankton and, and things like that in the water. And it was a really cool experience seeing these young students kind of engage with the harbor and engage with, you know, this marine life that occurs uh, so close to us. So I'm so glad with it, that this camp that you've developed this way for, for these young students to kind of get interested and to learn about, you know, sampling and, and learning about the ocean and, and what that means. Um, I, I would like to ask one more question of my own before we open it up then to the audience Q and A. Um, I'm curious, you know, you, so you, you've been a researcher with Embari. Um, there are various aquaria around the world where people can go and experience sea life. I'm, I'm wondering, as someone who's a researcher who's been out to sea, um, if you can speak to the importance of aquaria um, for those who maybe don't have the opportunity to go out to the ocean to see marine life and to understand marine life and what aquaria are doing for us uh, in the science of understanding the oceans. Yeah, um, aquaria, aquariums are uh, great places for people to go see organisms that they would never see otherwise. And the, the beauty, um, I, I know most people, when you're on the beach, if you see a jellyfish, you know, you, you run. <laughs> you don't want to get stung, but... Uh, they are just beautiful creatures, and uh, an aquarium sets that into place. Um, one of the, one of the interesting things about the summer camp is we take little we take ROVs and we put them in Monterey Harbor, um, and you know the the kids most of the kids have been to the aquarium, and then they go and put the ROVs in the water and see different things. You know, you, you might see a shoe or a can or something else where you're not going to see that at the aquarium, but but they do see all the organisms, but in the aquarium, you actually get to see them up close and personal and um, with much more clarity than you have in any other format, even even scuba diving, as, you, as you've uh, experienced and stuff like that. So, uh, and, and a lot of aquaria um, are engaged in conservation and other efforts in both the sample collection as well as uh, letting people know what what uh, what is important in the ocean to uh, be able to conserve what we have or to maintain what we have, um, and uh, yeah, I I grew up on the East Coast, and when I was a kid, there was plenty of cod. Uh, there isn't any more, um, and if we had a little more conservation back then, you know, maybe that wouldn't be the case. Yeah, it's so crucial, I think, for a lot of people to learn about fisheries and about what we have done to marine organisms around the world in our, in our fishing and in some cases overfishing. And cod is one of the best examples, I think, of, of that occurring in the ocean. There are certainly many others as well. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Uh, I am going to open it up now to our audience. 
Uh, so for those watching on the NASA Astrobiology Facebook or on the NASA Astrobiology YouTube channel, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Uh, we will try to load them into our queue here for us to discuss with Dr. Reed. Um, the first question I'd like to ask comes from a longtime viewer of our show who is very intrigued by the ocean worlds of our solar system, specifically places like Europa and Enceladus. Uh, this is Tom Caruso. Uh, Tom would like to know if you can compare um, hydrothermal vents at the bottom of Earth's oceans to possible ones at in these low gravity moons uh, on Enceladus and Europa. Um, what kinds of differences do you think we should expect in a, in a place like Europa or Enceladus versus the Earth's hydrothermal vent systems? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess the the big question is what are the what, what's what's the core doing um, on these moons? Is it uh, convecting? Is it stable? Um, and so on and so forth. And, and that's going to have an effect as to how the heat gets distributed. And as long as you can convect in a core like or in the mantle here on Earth where you get to move heat around, um, then you can have the aspect or the potential for having higher temperature fluids, um, much more so than um, if it's a you know, nice solid feature where you um, can't really penetrate. Uh, faults are also very important, how, how faulted is the system. So uh, it, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, how once we get um, more information from flybys and orbiting uh, satellites, um, what we learn more about the uh, inner workings of, of those moons. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, we should remind the audience, we have an upcoming mission. NASA's Europa Clipper mission is going to go to, to Europa. It's going to orbit around Jupiter and Europa together. Um, it's not going to be diving down into the ocean, um, but it will teach us a lot more about Europa's surface. Uh, we'll use instruments to better detect the extent of Europa's ocean to, to study the chemistry of the surface of Europa. If there are plumes, there's been some hypotheses and some data from telescopes to suggest there could be plumes of fluid at Europa as well. Uh, then Clipper has an instrument that will allow them to sample materials from plumes. Um, that same instrument will study the dust and the, the material environment around Europa as well. So um, there are upcoming missions. Currently, nothing is planned, uh, nothing is, is, is paid for, is going to Enceladus, but uh, there are some cool ideas in the works uh, from various researchers of Icy Worlds for getting out and studying uh, Enceladus again, as well as some of the other ocean worlds. Um, I would like to share a question now. Uh, our senior production assistant, Sarah Treadwell, asked her own question. Uh, Sarah wants to know, since you've traveled and, and you've been to all these various locations um, on the ocean, uh, what is your favorite location in which you've gotten to do research thus far? Ooh, uh, that's a good one. Um, I, I guess once once I'm out at sea, um, uh, it's, you're, you're pretty much, everything looks the same. There's a lot of blue, blue water, blue sky, and so on and so forth. But um, once you get underneath the, the blue water in the sky and on the seafloor, um, I, I think uh, the mud volcanoes um, where, you know, they're coming up. Um, I think that's the most fascinating because it, I, I don't understand it as much or as well as uh, some of the other places and what exactly is happening and how it's happening. And, and I don't think we have we certainly don't have the data and the samples uh, from from that environment relative to, let's say, high temperature hydrothermal systems or or even ridge flank hydrothermal systems. So I would, I think that'd be, uh, I'd put that place as number one. That's awesome. Yeah. It's so cool. When you do a research, it gives you a chance. Uh, if you're into, you know, traveling the world and, and learning about unique systems, um, you can do that as a researcher. Uh, and that kind of leads to my next question. Then uh, user, Mr. Praximus on YouTube uh, asks this, uh, as a master's degree marine biologist who wants to continue into a PhD in deep marine biology, uh, specifically with usage of, of ROVs and other technologies, uh, user Mr. Proximus wants to know um, what subjects might they want to follow um, in order to better develop a good PhD project that allows them to go out and do deep marine biology with ROVs and such. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer 
that uh, you need to know the fundamental science uh, before you get in more in the broader application. So, so for me, um, chemistry uh, and geology is important. Um, if you're into fluid flow, you know, physics is important. Biology, um, making sure you understand the basics of biology and ecology and, and how, uh, how life works fundamentally. Um, the ocean is just another aspect of it. Um, it's just an, an application of the fundamental uh, processes that you, you learn about. So I would say a solid foundation in basic science is a, is a great start. And then if you're, um, you know, then to go to grad school in, in one of these fields, um, you know, uh, th there's quite a few oceanographic institutions or ocean institutions that have oceanographic uh, programs and find someone who's been doing deep sea research and goes out to sea a lot um, because they typically keep going out to sea. Um, and there's a lot of people doing a lot of fun stuff. Um, Especially even now in the trenches, there's a, a bunch of works so that's really deep sea. Mm. It's very cool. Yeah, it makes, I don't ever hear about that. I, I want to go down to deep sea as well and go study some of those things. Um, we have a similar question from user Niall Gakeward, uh, Gakewad on YouTube. Uh, Niall says that they're currently doing a master's in biochemistry and is immensely interested in astrobiology, intending to do a PhD. Um, their question is, what steps would you suggest to take to, to enter this field? Um, but I think, you know, you've kind of already answered that to a degree. So I'd like to add to what Niall's asking and, and actually ask you about the importance of mentorship uh, in your own career and for some of these younger students doing master's degrees or undergraduate degrees who want to earn PhDs. Um, what's your vision of the importance of finding a mentor um, to enter this field as well? I, I would say a mentor is very important. Um, I've seen people that have, uh, if you have a mentor, it makes everything, everything work, uh, cause they will know what you need to know and what you need to do and how to do it and, and can antagonize you or, you know, promote you, um, in a direction, um, to move you along. Um, and so having a mentor is, uh, is very important. Um, I think uh, over the years, people have become more aware of the uh, need for strong mentorship um, in, in university settings. So uh, that's always good. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be um, your, you know, your advisor. It could be a postdoc or a senior uh, graduate student uh, can come in and act as a mentor just as well as, uh, as the PI. So, um, or, or even, uh, someone who's been in the lab as a tech in a technical capacity, you know, it's just, uh, putting it in. So, um, mentorship is very important and, um, it can really help out your career or, or, and also guide you in different directions, um, you know, or make you aware of different directions. Sometimes we get a little tunnel vision as to, uh, we, we think we want to go in this direction and we're unaware of other potential directions. And so having those possibilities put out to us too is, is always good. That's a great point. I, I was inspired when I was younger. I was earning degrees in biology and chemistry and I was inspired by Peter Diamandis to go on and study astrophysics and then to earn my PhD in geology to, to allow myself to transition through several different fields of study, um, which I found very helpful in the long run. And um, in mentorship, I've been very lucky myself to mentor uh, various students and to be involved in their lives and watch their careers grow. One person I've watched grow a lot is our production assistant, Anarup Mahanti. Uh, Anarup also has asked a question for you, um, and I, I kind of like his wording here. Uh, he says, what are the major challenges, uh, technological or physical, in exploring the seafloor? But he adds to that, uh, is there any challenge in exploring the ocean uh, that might be similar to how we have a cosmic speed limit for space exploration. Um, so like at the fundamental level, is there something really challenging about exploring the deep? Oh, well, um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, time on the seafloor um, and how fast the vehicles can move. Um, and and uh, the nice thing about, well, submarines, you're sort of limited to about five hours a, a day on the seafloor. 
Uh, with an ROV, uh, you could have it down for 24 hours a day. Um, and we've had an R- we've had Jason, which is an ROV run out of Woods Hole, uh, Massachusetts. Um, uh, that that one has been down. We've had it down for a week. And um, as uh, uh, one of the questions earlier, what we do is we send samplers down with an elevator. It's called an elevator. Basically, you send samples down. It sinks to the seafloor. The ROV goes over, takes the samples off, and then um, you go collect your samples. Put your your samples back on the elevator. It comes up to the surface, and you take them off at the ship and analyze them and recycle that. Um, and, and even with that process, even having the extra hours, you can't really cover a lot of ground. Um, and it's a minuscule amount of seafloor relative to the seafloor on the earth. Um, we, um, where the uh, octopuses were on the seafloor, we spent, you know, I think three weeks diving all the time on this one feature that's uh, about a kilometer long and half a kilometer wide. And, you know, it, it took that amount of time just to do that small portion of the seafloor. So, um, if there was some way we could automate, um, make things a little faster, um, and, you know, see the seafloor, that'd be great. One option or one way, uh, the sort of the community is moving is, uh, through autonomous vehicles. And, um, the upside of that is you can cover a lot more ground with a bunch of smaller vehicles. And the downside is again, the cost and the engineering capabilities and so on and so forth to actually make that happen. So I, I guess it's a matter of how much space you can actually see, currently, you know, see on the seafloor right now. Yeah, and as you mentioned, it's so little that we've explored. Um, and that kind of intrigues me. It makes me think, you know, much as like right now we have folks at NASA who are sitting in command rooms at places like JPL and sending commands you know, via radio wave to Mars, and then they're they're telling our rovers what to do on the surface of Mars from so far away. But well, even in space exploration, you know, with rovers and, and orbiters, we are trying to automate more and more so that the, the the spacecraft, the robot, can collect more data and know how to collect more data on its own and know how to avoid hazards and things like that. And so that makes me wonder in the future, could we see like a submersible being guided by people sitting in a command room at their local university and the rover's out in the middle of the ocean just doing its own thing. Um, it's kind of cool to think about. And I'm glad you mentioned the, the, the elevator system for bringing samples up and down. That's not unlike how NASA Perseverance, uh, the rover right now, is collecting and caching samples that we're going to eventually go pick up and bring back to Earth um, to study. And it's a really important question. You know, As researchers, it's so helpful when we have the sample in our hand to work with. We can take it to specialized instruments. We can share it amongst different research groups. And I myself, I, I've been very blessed previously uh, through a NASA, an exit biology grant to travel to the Arctic and collect samples at a field site, a planetary analog, and bring them back to America to study. Um, and so our next question comes from user Arunava Padar. Uh, it's an important question that many of us who've retrieved samples and have brought them back to the laboratory have had to ask ourselves uh, to make sure that we're being true to the science. Uh, Arunava wants to know, um, how is the condition of the fluid samples, and, and I'll, I'll add any samples that you collect, uh, things like pH, temperature, mineralogy, um, how are these co- conditions, when they're collected near the seafloor, maintained during the journey from the ocean um, back to the ship, and then and then from the ship back to the laboratory? Um, how do we make sure that we are actually studying the right thing from the seafloor? Oh, that's a good question. And, and the reality is, is, uh, we do our best. Um, in the case of fluids and what I do, um, it, uh, typically reactions don't occur very much or not at all. Um, and there's ways of preserving, adding a preservative, whether it be in my case, adding some acid to the sampler on the seafloor to keep whatever solutes are there in solution. Um, for microbiology, that's another question. There's a whole new uh, focus of trying to collect the samples in pressurized uh, systems because pressure can influence um, the microbial communities and, and their activity. So, so there's um, yeah, and and then if you collect some sediment, 
Uh, we do know if it's a carbonate rich sediment, it will exchange with the pore waters on the way up. Um, and it's in very, you know, you're taking it from a two degree environment and bringing it to the ship at 20 degrees. Uh, things happen. Um, gases, you know, you're uh, 300 atmospheres at the bottom of the seafloor and one atmosphere at the surface. And if you have dissolved gases that are in excessive sort of standard temperature and pressure uh, uh, capabilities, then yes, they will um, come out of solution. Uh, so, so we have to be aware of our environment and uh, try to do our best um, knowing what potential caveats exist. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. The same thing for Arctic samples and the same thing for Martian samples. Um, you know, we, we, we have to think through it and, and do our best, uh, honestly. Uh, our next question comes from uh, another production assistant for the show, uh, Mariam Nassim. Uh, and Miriam uh, wants to know if you could talk a bit more about the opportunities that are available for graduate and PhD students to, uh, as students, conduct research on scientific vessels or in ocean expeditions. Um, yes, there's there's um, there there's uh, different ways of, of um, there's a thing called UNALS. Uh, I can't think of the, the, what the acronym stands for, but it's basically university something for oceanography, it, I don't know. But it, uh, basically it's a consortium of ships that are run by uh, different universities and those ships are to conduct oceanographic research. Um, oftentimes those ships uh, will have uh, PIs uh, from different universities um, using those ships and they will need people to uh, go out and conduct research. There's also other programs like um, uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic runs a program for uh, getting people involved with Alvin, uh, which is the submersible. Um, and I think they've also had one maybe for Jason in the past, I'm not sure, which is the ROV. And the idea there is getting um, uh, gra late, later stage graduate students and postdocs out on the vessels to see how those vessels work and operate and what they can provide. Um, how are they different than uh, just coring and uh, or collecting uh, water using hydrocasts or, or something along those lines. So uh, there are distinct programs. Um, I don't know. I, I can't really, other than the Woods Hole one, I can't point you directly to one. Um, and uh, there are, the UNALS page will certainly have PIs and their university uh, pr principal investigators and the universities of who's um, taking the ships out. Um, and then you could contact those people to see what um, what they're doing and if they need help or people and so on and so forth. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. And I just realized we've actually come to the top of the hour and the end of our show, unfortunately. Uh, Dr. Wheat, it has been a humongous pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, and I look forward to hearing more about your research in mud volcanoes and, and other places on the seafloor. And I hope that you get a humongous grant to help fund the research that you want to do uh, and to hear far more about some of these incredible things we're learning as we continue to explore that rather unexplored region of our own world in the deep sea. Uh, for those watching, if you'd like to learn a bit more about Dr. Reed's work, uh, you can check out his lab's website at mlml.sjsu.edu slash subseafloor hyphen lab. Uh, Dr. Wheat, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we sign off? Um, I would just say if you're interested in working in the deep sea and the seafloor, the main thing is perseverance. Um, perseverance counts a lot. I love it. Yeah, perseverance counts for everything. Um, so for those who want to stay in the loop on upcoming episodes of the show, as well as more info about opportunities and events from NASA Astrobiology, uh, Mike Toyon, our director and producer, is putting a link on the screen right now so you can sign up for the official mailing list from NASA Astrobiology. Uh, I hope that all of you will stay tuned just for a little bit after the credits roll here for a sneak peek at episode two of Astrobiology in the Field. Uh, this time, Astrobiology in the Field takes you to Greenland to study not only some of the oldest rocks on the Earth, but some questions about what potentially could be some of the oldest signs of life 
on the earth. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Wheat, for joining us. Thank you to our audience for joining us. Uh, and until next time, everyone, stay curious.